Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Loneliness and brain change. We've known for quite some time that loneliness can have a major impact on a person's health, both mental and physical. Now there's uh, emerging evidence that it can actually speed up the progression of dementia. Joining me today is Tipa Snow and Joanna's in the background there. We'll hear from her in a few moments' time. Uh, Tipa, this isn't really new to you, but it seems to suddenly be new to the scientific community. Yeah, and it's funny because the way I under uh, learned about it and began to understand it more deeply is the research that's out there. But I guess what happens is people don't look at what's necessarily written about the impact of dementia and then social isolation or lack of stimulation when it comes to progression of symptoms, at least, if not progression of actual dementia. I, I think where perhaps people on the ground would see it is in um, behavioral patterns, whereas mm. I think some people are now starting to dive into actual structural changes that may come from, from loneliness. Yeah, and so what what folks think about is sort of what you see as a result when somebody hasn't had interactions and they are seeking interactions, and so they become more emotionally distressed um, about not being able to find people or, or, or interact with the people they're looking for, or they want to do something and they can't, they're not supposed to do that thing. And so we see that negative sort of emotional impact. But what people don't frequently recognize is if I don't use pathways, synaptic pathways in my brain, and the chemistry of my brain doesn't alter up and down, up and down with um, the chemicals that we we use to make our brain works, dopamine, serotonin, um, endorphins. Um, what ends up happening is when I need a chemical rush, what can happen is um, cortisol becomes a chemical that gets used instead of more beneficial and helpful ones, as does adrenaline, because all of a sudden things that shouldn't be threatening seem to be threatening me because I just don't get much rehearsal. I don't get much practice. And so when a demand is made or I'm seeking and I can't figure something out, I become more readily depressed or distressed or anxious or frustrated. So is, is this a regression or is this sort of going back to the basics of our brain, which is the flight, fight, fright, the, the need to survive? Yeah. And so if I'm not getting a lot of interactions, um, then any interaction stimulates more of a primitive part of my brain uh, because my brain is not getting routinely exercised, if you would, or put through its paces, or I'm not getting those chemical patterns that you and I get when we engage with one another. Because when one person speaks, I take that data, process that data, and then respond to that data. Um, and if I'm not getting any of that, that's sort of dead time, dead space. And I'm not, I'm not using my chemicals. Chemicals don't fire. And then when I go to do something, everything is more of a startle reaction rather than a simply a rhythm of living reaction or pattern. So it is more primitive. Well, you, you know, one of my passions and hobbies is sort of sitting down and reading all of the studies that seem to be out there in the world these days. Mm -hmm. uh, this one in particular was sort of Concluding Staying busy, Greg, are you? Staying, staying real busy. <laughs> real busy. <laughs> Chronic loneliness can lead to a 30% increased risk of premature death. Uh, another yeah. another one of their findings was people who are lonely are, are, are more susceptible to illness. Obviously, those two go hand in hand. You're ill. You. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the interesting thing is it isn't just um, physical illness. It's it, it actually reduces your brain and body's ability to react and respond, um, your immune response. So since we know that this, this thing called COVID-19 is, um, is really uh, much more dangerous if you have an Im impaired immune system and being alone impairs your immune system, it, it seems sort of counterproductive to isolate people in order to reduce their transmission risk when in fact, what we may be trading is one monster for another because what's happening is people are not using and engaging their brains and so it makes their immune response much less effective, which if there is an exposure, ooh, 
they are at much higher risk for a much more significant bout of illness or even death. Added to which, um, one of the things that happens when we get socially isolated, we don't breathe as well. Which, why would you breathe? What do you well, use it? For? Breathing is kind of important in my books. I mean, I don't know an awful lot about, uh, you know, the human body, but that, that's right up there as being one of the top. <laughs> yeah, when you stop doing that, that's pretty much that's right. the game's over, you know. So, yeah, but if you're not talking, you're not singing, you're not engaging, why do you need to breathe so deeply? Why would you need to catch your breath? Why would you, you don't laugh. What are you going to laugh at if you you're don't. just isolated? The scientists obviously have a lot of time to to experiment and, and to come up with all of these startling conclusions. Uh, one of the ones was uh, mice, uh, mice, two weeks in isolation, have higher levels of brain chemicals related to stress. I, I don't know how they measure that. Or, and solitary isolation shrinks nerve cells in mice. I, you know, again, this is this is pretty high level stuff, but I, I'm sure it has some parallel to us. Yeah, it sure enough does. Because the place where we see this playing out is when we're talking about uh, stress-related chemicals, that's that cortisol I was mentioning. And cortisol is a chemical you definitely want flowing in your brain if you're attacked by a Siberian tiger or there's a cobra by your foot. But it's not such a great chemical to have on board all the time because it uh, actually impairs your brain and body's ability to function in a routine and regular way. And it impacts your blood sugar consumption and your blood pressure and your uh, ability to fight infections and your sleep state uh, ability. So it's really, really, really dangerous. <laughs> That's the bottom line on it. And you know, the stuff they did to mice, you don't want the outcome what they do to the mice. I mean, they, they, they actually destroy the mice so they can look at their brain cells um, after they do this exposure for two weeks. So, I mean, it's pretty significant research. And in human beings, um, we're looking, we don't have to destroy human beings. We can actually look at their brain activity um, in a PET scan or a SPEC scan or um, a functional MRI that allows us to look at the chemistry in the brain and look at chemical composition kind of thing, what's going on with chemicals and structures. And we find that, oh, Unfortunately, we're seeing the same kind of things in human beings, whether it be um, mental health issues where they're isolated because they don't have anybody in their life or they choose, quote unquote, choose isolation. They can't figure out how to engage, I would, I would frame it. Um, but now we're looking at it with people living with dementia and we're seeing very similar patterns. What we thought was inevitable <laughs> may in fact be um, partially induced by environmental deprivation. So, and, Joanne's sitting in the background there, and I'm going to ask her, Joanne, knowing that loneliness has uh, an impact like this on, on persons living with dementia, what does this mean for uh, care partners? Uh, we've, we've discussed that it's an increase in the fight, fight, fight uh, response, um, stress, uh, stressful situations. Uh, people can become more paranoid. Uh, their decision-making skills uh, decrease, uh, a decrease in learning and memory. They may be more aggressive. So what, what might that mean for, for a care partner? Well, there's a, a really big change with this COVID-19 and being isolated. Um, I have a family member that is in assisted living with vascular dementia, and she is now losing her words because she's had no real communication on a regular basis. And that's affecting my niece in a very bad way because now she's starting to call her daughter she or her instead of her name because she can't bring that up. And so that's very painful. And I would think that as you lose that communication because of that, that, that becomes very difficult on the care partner, really. And plus they can't see each other. So if you're, if you're a family member, this gives you some insight into perhaps what your person is dealing with. If you're a professional care partner in a, in a care facility, this calls on you to change your whole approach, doesn't it, Tipa? Yeah, sure enough yeah. does. Because we, we know that people are being asked to keep people at social distance, which is simply not going to be an option if someone has dementia because they need support and care within arm's length or else they wouldn't be where they are. Um, but how we spend our time, what we do during that time, how we engage with people. Active engagement makes a huge difference. So when I say to you, Greg, hey, it's Tipa. Good morning, sir. Hey, Tipa, I respond. Yeah. You respond because I set it up with that pause 
expecting the other side of the conversation. Ooh, hey, I like your shirt. Good looking. Thank, thank yeah. you. Yeah. You're welcome. Ooh, hey, Greg. Yes. <laughs> now I have to pause because <laughs> keeping in mind that, you know, if he hasn't had a lot of practice, that was that moment where if I lean in or say it again, I could get the cortisol going rather than the oxytocin going. So that ability to change my tone, to add those pauses, to give, oh, hey, Greg, look at this. Bring the enthusiasm in my voice. In other words, I have to prepare myself for the interaction before the interaction. Um, because when I'm moving into that person's world, I may be it for the next hour. And I think people don't realize. And so sometimes walking by the door and peeking your head in, you don't have to put the mask on if, if nobody else is out in the hall and go, Greg, hey, man, <laughs> wanted to give you a high five. <laughs> yeah. People, this, this whole pandemic has uh, been a challenge for, for care partners uh, as well as for persons living with dementia, but for mm -hmm. care partners, where can people go to get some current information on this? Because things seem to have... Are they changing or do we just need to apply our skills even more? We need to apply our skills even more because um, unfortunately, most government support systems are indicating the last group they are going to give freedom to, <laughs> the last group that will have access to other human beings, the last group that will get to spend time in intimate space with others are people living with dementia in in communal settings and residential settings or family members who are alone at home with someone, that may be the last group that comes out. And so more than ever, if you know someone, if you have capacity, if, you, if you're at all a compassionate person, figuring out strategies and times and, and, and abilities to make a difference, to basically do a Zoom interaction, uh, call up 10 songs in your head and say, oh, ooh, hey, Greg, I don't know if you know this one. This is a musical. I'm going to give you a, give you a, it's one of three musicals. I'm going to see if you can figure it out without a clue. And if not, I'll, I'll see if I can help you out there, but I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. I'm going to wash any that, ideas. That sounds like my wife. <laughs> sounds like a relationship issue, huh? Actually it's a, it's a musical. Let's see. It was Rogers and Hammerstein. South Pacific. South Pacific. Excellent. Yeah, you got it, Joanne. Yeah. But what that just did is cause Joanne to fire multiple, multiple synapses. Um, and it, we think, oh, well, you know, it's hard to do it. And it's like, yeah, it is. I mean, you have to prepare, like I said. But I think if we did that, it wouldn't be just better for her brain. <laughs> Might be a good idea for mine. <laughs> Deepa, where can more people get information? Do you have a website that uh, is easily accessible? Are you, are you running mm -hmm. webinars or, or, or what are you doing these days? We're doing some of both. Uh, we're on Facebook every morning at 8 and, and Eastern time, of course. Mm -hmm. that's It's always my, my time, Eastern time. And then at 5 o'clock, we have some stuff going on. We also have a, a site on our website that's devoted to basically COVID-19 kinds of information mm -hmm. and how you can access it. Um, we have a bunch of recorded stuff. We also so have openings for Ask Deepa Anything coming up soon and on a Wednesday evening if folks are interested in pursuing questions there. We do our very best to be open to the idea that people need support um, through this, and there's a lot of training to be done. And your website is easily accessible at? TeepaSnow.com. Nice and simple. Tipa, <laughs> Joanne, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Greg. Greg. Thanks, Tipa. My pleasure.